Uh, so let's start our M seminar. Uh, so today we are happy to have Dominic Joyce from Oxford University. Uh, the title is on the screen, Universal Structure and Enumerative Invariant Theories. And uh, Dominic, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so Jan has the slides of this, which he you could post in the chat if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, uh, Lina's supposed to send them, so Lina. Okay. Um, okay. Anyway, so um, what I'm talking about is um, mostly work in progress by myself, um, but some of it is uh, in this paper um, on the archive with uh, this is the appropriate situation. Uh, which is joint with uh, Jacob Gross and Yuji Tanyaka. Um, and um, so um, what I want to talk about is enumerative invariants um, in a rather broad uh, picture. Um, so these, these, you can get these in either algebraic geometry uh, or in differential geometry. Um, and it's a study of, of invariants, you know, perhaps numbers, um, I alpha of Tor, which count in some sense um, semi stable objects, E, in some problem, um, in which you fix some topological invariants. Uh, for example, that could be that you might be fixing the churn character of a vector bundle or sheaf um, to have some fixed value alpha. Um, and uh, okay, well, sometimes your moduli space might be a compact manifold if you're very lucky. Um, uh, usually, in algebraic geometry, at least, the moduli space uh, would have to have be given some kind of uh, a virtual class structure. Um, so we're forming a virtual class for our moduli space of semi-stable objects um, in some homology theory. Um, so this might live in the homology of the moduli space. And then quite often you define, if you, if you don't like um, the homology class itself, you'd form your invariants by integrating some natural cohomology classes, mu alpha, over this virtual class. Um, so an example to have in mind could, for example, be uh, Donaldson invariants of four manifolds in which you form moduli space of instantons, and then you define Donaldson polynomial invariants, these I alpha of tors, by um, integrating um, some universal cohomology classes over the moduli spaces of um, uh, instantons with fixed C1 and C2, let's say. Um, okay, so I'm going to call off the theory C linear if the objects E that we're counting live in well, a C linear additive category A. Um, okay, uh, so for example, that could be an abelian category or a drive category. Um, uh, D Dominic, do you yeah. allow internal symmetries of your objects where your semi-stables do not have automorphisms? Yes, definitely. And that, that's one of the big things I've got to say is, is that um, my theory will tell you how to count semi-stables. Um, uh, but that being an additive category is excluding things like gromov witten invariants where curves in some space, uh, they don't really you don't, it's not natural to add them up under direct sums and things like that. Um, okay, so, so some examples of this would be, um, oops, uh, invariants counting coherent sheaves on surfaces uh, in the style of, uh, well, there's a, there's, there's a Springer lecture notes volume by uh, Takuro Mochizuki, uh, which is dealing with um, invariants counting sheaves on surfaces you can think about them as algebraic Donaldson invariants. And uh, the stuff I do has quite a lot in common with Mochizuki, um, particularly in, in terms of some of the methods I use. Um, Donaldson Thomas invariants of Calabi-Yau three manifolds uh, or Fano three manifolds uh, can be fitted into this framework. Donaldson Thomas type invariants of Calabi-Yau four folds. Uh, this is a subject which is fairly much in its infancy, but um, a few years ago, um, in a paper with Dennis Borisov, I showed that you could define uh, virtual classes for Calabi-Yau 4 moduli spaces 
uh, recent work by O and Thomas and by uh, some other people has produced a more algebra geometric construction of the, those virtual classes. So um, some kind of Donaldson Thomas theory of Clavier fourfolds is clearly going to happen in the medium term future. Um, you could also think about Donaldson invariants of four manifolds. I prefer to work over U of M. Um, and there's kind of two separate cases, a B2 plus equals one or B2 plus greater than one here. Um, okay, so, um, so what I want to say is, is that lots of these theories have a, a common universal structure. Um, and let me give you uh, an outline of this structure. Um, so firstly, um, I want to form two moduli stacks, M and MPL. So it's going to be important for me to work in, in the world of stacks rather than in the world of schemes. Uh, so these are moduli stacks of all objects E in your category A. So here M is really the usual moduli stack, such as a moduli stack of coherent sheaves, which Groffman Dick would have defined. MPL is what I call a projective linear moduli stack. Uh, this is a moduli stack of objects E, modulo, not, not up to isomorphism, but up to projective isomorphism. What this really means is that we quotient out by the moleculars of the identity, where lambda lies in GM or, or U1. Um, so in the world of schemes, M and MPL will be the same because scheme, moduli schemes don't remember automorphisms. But in the world of stacks, these things are different. And there's a, a morphism from M into MPL whose fiber is BGM. That is, whose fiber is point mod GM as a stack. Got that. Um, okay, so secondly, we're going to take some quotient K0 of A, uh, so some quotient K of A of K0 of A. Um, this is basically the lattice of topological invariants uh, of our objects, which we're going to, to use. So for example, um, this could be the Chern character map from uh, the, the Grothman D group of your category into the even cohomology, if we're thinking about coherent sheaves on something. Um, basically, these are the fixed, fixed, the fixed invariant, the topological invariants of which we're going to fix before we take invariants are living in this category K of A. And the moduli stack M should have a splitting uh, over classes alpha in this K theory of M alpha. Uh, and the projective linear moduli stack also splits this way. Um, in the derived category case, usually these are actually the connected components of M and M alpha. So uh, K of A is actually pi zero of M. Um, okay, uh, there should be a symmetric and bioadditive Euler form, chi, going from the um, K of A cross K of A into Z. Um, so uh, if you're used to Donaldson Thomas theory of Calabria threefolds, the symmetry might confuse you here because uh, in, in, the Calabria, in the odd Calabria case, chi actually gets to be anti-symmetric. But uh, in my primary um, setup, I want, I want a symmetric Euler form. Um, uh, so what is it for three-dimensional Calabrias? Is it zero? Uh, yeah, well, for odd dimensional club, yes, it would become zero, but actually, the pit, as I'm going to say in a, in a few minutes, the picture I'm, the picture I'm going to outline needs to be, um, needs to be modified in the odd, odd club, yeah, case. Um, okay, so we can then form the homology of these stacks. Um, and it's important that, um, what well, the, the correct notion of a homology of stack uh, is something which, which takes into account the stabilizer groups. So for example, the homology of the stack point mod GM, which is a single point with stabilizer group GM, um, is a homology of CP infinity, because CP infinity is the, the, the classifying space of, uh, of the group GM. Okay, so we can form the homology of these two stacks. And even though these have the same points, because they have different stabilizer groups, they actually have different homology groups. Um, okay, and so we, we form these homology spaces. Now, I want to define a shifted versions of these stacks, um, of these homology in which, so for M, in the M group, we, we shift, 
the, the degree of the homology of M alpha by chi of alpha alpha. Uh, and I put a hat on it to indicate that I'm making that shift on the homology group. And for the projective linear thing, uh, I shift the, the group for the uh, MPL alpha by a two minus chi of alpha alpha. Okay. Uh, homology is somehow related because kind of one stack is a quotient by the other one yes. by sort of gerb. Yes. There is a morphism, well, so there's a morphism from M into MPL. That gives you a morphism from H star of M into H star of MPL. Um, most of the time, this is actually surjective and you can regard the MPL homology as a kind of quotient of the M homology by a kind of ideal. Mm. Um, that's not true in the derived category case when alpha is zero, if alpha is a zero class. But um, for almost all non-zero classes, the morphism from this homology group to that homology group is surjective. Okay, so um, some work I did a few years ago, um, you can find a, an, an unfinished document on my webpage about it. Um, this makes the homology or the, the, the shifted homology of M into a vertex algebra, a graded vertex algebra, and the shifted homology of MPL into a graded Lie algebra. Um, so this is a... So homomorphism just forgets the extra structure or how it... Um, well, the, uh, well, so Borch has told us that if you have a vertex algebra, there's a way of constructing a Lie algebra from it. Um, so, so Borchers says that if you've got a vertex algebra, you could, there's a way of taking a quotient of that by an ideal to get a Lie algebra. So the projection from um, H star of M into H star of MPL, um, that the, 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 the ideal which Borchers qu quotients by is in the kernel of that morphism. And this gives you a Lie algebra morphism. Um, most of the time, uh, except in the drive category case when alpha, alpha equals zero, this actually induces a, an isomorphism. So essentially this, this, this is a quotient of that by an ideal and the Lie algebra structure on here is induced by the vertex algebra structure on here. And so uh, since you mentioned that instantons like for U1 for instantons, uh, will you reconstruct uh, Nakajima's story like infinite Heisenberg and no, no, uh, not in an easy way. No. no. So, so these are the moduli stacks of all objects of everything in your category. Um, so the Nakajima story uh, is about moduli spaces, semi-stable objects. Um, and OK, so it's likely that the moduli space of semi-stable objects sit inside here as a vector subspace, but also my vertex algebra structure and Nakajima's vertex algebra structures are rather different. For example, the translation operator in my vertex algebra, it keeps you in the same moduli space alpha and it increases the homology degree. Whereas Nakajima's translation operator um, increases the, the second churn class of alpha. So the, the translation operators are uh, mapping in different directions. Hmm. So I think there's, there's some kind of, um, I think that there's some kind of relation between my story and Nakajima's story in that I think that you could define the Nakajima algebra using certain operators in my algebra, but it's a rather, it's a complicated and difficult relation to make. So also, so the, this vertex algebra structure and this Lie algebra structure, they're difficult things. Um, you, you can't just write them down or not, not easily. Um, uh, and in fact, well, so I kind of started, got into this whole mess because I, I, I came to believe that this thing had a, a Lie algebra structure, which was involved in the wall crossing formula for invariance. Uh, at the time I was working on, on the Clavier R4 story. Um, but when I tried to work to construct this Lie, the Lie bracket on this thing, I ended up inventing the Borch's definition of vertex algebra by mistake. So, and a vertex algebra is a horribly complicated algebraic object. And it's kind of got an infinite number of Lie bracket type operations satisfying an infinite number of um, Jacobi type of identities. Um, and it's a huge amount of data. 
But actually, the, the vertex algebra structure on this thing turns out to be easier to write down than the Lie bracket on this thing. Um, and so actually, vertex algebras were originally invented as a kind of byproduct of certain constructions of Lie algebras. You know, so if you want to construct Cax Moody algebra, Lie algebras, for example, um, the way people actually built them is that they they kind of come out of vertex algebras. Okay, so so uh, so if you want to know, you know what is this what is the Lie bracket on this homology, um, I can only really tell you in terms of operations on this vertex algebra here, um, and neither of them is an easy thing to write down. Okay, uh, next I want to say that there's some kind of notion of stability condition on my category A, um, which I'm going to write tall. So if A is a category of coherent sheaves, uh, this could be Giesel stability or possibly mu stability for some polarization on X. Um, if A was a triangulated category, a derived category of something, then you would probably want to use Brochian stability conditions. Um, in the case of Donaldson theory, for a compact oriented four manifold X with B2 plus equals one, uh, what the stability condition really means is it's a splitting of two dimensional drum cohomology into H2 plus and H2 minus, where that's actually just a, a one dimensional space. Um, and okay, so, so if you vary the metric on your four manifold, then you can vary this splitting and the Donaldson invariance can change as the splitting varies. Okay, um, so then for each class alpha in your um, K theory, or you can form moduli spaces of stable objects and semi-stable objects in class alpha. Um, so here the stable moduli space is actually a substack of the projective linear moduli space. Um, so that's, so basically any stable object will have automorphism group GM or U1. And when we form this projective linear moduli stack, we divide out by um, the GMs. So therefore any stable object has trivial automorphism group in this PL stack, uh, which means that actually the stable moduli scheme is in fact a substack of this stack here. Um, so in order to form unit in unit of invariance, we need uh, our stable moduli spaces to have some kind of structure of, you might call a virtual oriented manifold. So in algebraic geometry, the right notion is that of a, a scheme with perfect obstruction theory in the sense of Baron Hathan uh, Although, okay, there's also a Calabi R4 version of the story in which we have to use Calabi R4 uh, obstruction theories instead. In differential geometry, uh, if you're lucky, you can, you can uh, make some kind of generic perturbation and then your moduli spaces may simply be oriented manifolds. Okay, so we, we need the semi-stable moduli spaces to have a properness, a, a compactness property, um, uh, which is usually true, let's say if you want a coherent sheaves on a projective scheme or something like that. Um, so if, but the, the, the semi-stable moduli scheme may not have this virtual oriented manifold structure. So in the special case in which the stable moduli scheme equals the semi-stable moduli scheme, so there are no strictly semi-stables in the problem, then your moduli space is, has, is a virtual oriented manifold and it's compact, so then it has a virtual class, um, which we regard as an element of the homology of this um, moduli stack. Uh, and the virtual dimension is going to be two minus chi of alpha alpha. And if you remember the, the shift here um, is two minus chi of alpha alpha. So um, the fact that this, this gives you the correct virtual dimension uh, means that the, um, the, this homology class actually lives in the zeroth graded homology of this thing um, with respect to our funny grading. And this zeroth graded homology is actually a Lie algebra. Okay, so um, in the cases that I care about, we can already prove all of parts A through to E, um, given my, my work on vertex algebras and things. Okay, so, so here is the, the part of the story which is at least partly conjectural. Okay, so part F is coming back to Jan, one of Jan's questions. Um, in lots of 
invariant theories, you have a problem defining the invariants, defining the virtual classes, uh, if the stable moduli space is not equal to the semi-stable moduli space. So that is when the moduli spaces uh, contain strictly semi-stable points. So in gauge theory, for example, Donaldson theory and instantons, um, the strictly semi-stable points correspond to reducible connections. So uh, for in Donaldson theory, having reducible connections in your moduli space is a problem because basically your manifold becomes singular. Um, and then you, you have difficulty forming a, a virtual class, a, a fundamental class for it. Okay, so I claim that there is basically a systematic way to define some kind of virtual class, which now should leave in homology of the rationals rather than integers um, in essentially all of these counting invariant theories. Um, so that there's going to be a systematic way. So I'm claiming you can define Donaldson invariants, for example, in four manner for four, or for four manifolds uh, in places in which there are reducible connections exist. You know, so uh, for things where the, uh, the your, your kind of co-primeness conditions don't hold. Um, <clears throat> okay, so firstly, I claim you can extend these invariants to to all to counting invariants in all classes, uh, but now over the rationals. Secondly, I claim that if you have two different stability conditions. Uh, now for some class in your K theory, then there is a, a wall crossing formula, which writes the stability, which writes the, so I'm really thinking about uh, these virtual classes being my invariants. If you prefer, you could think about the invariants as numbers you get by integrating cohomology classes over your, homo over your homology class. But from my point of view, it's easier to think about the homology classes themselves as being the invariants. Okay, so I expect that if you've got two stability conditions, uh, then you can write the virtual class for the new stability condition as a sum of repeatedly brackets of the virtual classes of the old stability condition. The sum is over all classes, all classes alpha one up to n, which add up to alpha. Uh, you have some combinatorial coefficient u twiddle of alpha one up to alpha n and tor and tor twiddle. So this is um, these are defined. Uh, in my previous work from about 2005 on configurations in abelian categories. Um, so at the time I was working for wall crossing formulae for motivic invariants. And I came up with this wall crossing formula, which is kind of universal wall crossing formula stated in, in a Lie algebra. And this Lie bracket here is the Lie bracket on this uh, funny graded uh, Lie algebra here. Um, which I talked about, which came out of the vertex algebra story. So, okay, so this is this is basically this. Um, in nice cases, such as Bridgeton stability or slope stability, um, this is essentially equivalent to the Konsevich Sobman um, wall crossing formula, which came up in Donaldson uh, Thomas theory. Um, so you, you if if you're working with Bridgeton stability, you could write this in a, in a Konsevich Sobman style way. Um, and in fact, I explain how to do that in uh, the, the three author paper on the archive. Okay, um, but, uh, and the Konsevich Sobman wall crossing formula isn't really good for things like Giesecke stability, uh, coherent sheaves, where these stability conditions are a bit more complicated. Um, and thirdly, uh, we can often give an explicit, uh, an inductive definition of these um, these classes using the wall crossing uh, a wall crossing formula and the method of pair invariants. So that's something that's reasonably well known. Um, if you if you've got a problem with your moduli space containing strictly semi-stables, something that people often do is that they consider a moduli space of pairs of an object in the original moduli problem and a morphism from some line bundle into it, for example. Um, so we did that. So, so then you form some kind of stable pair invariance and you use that as a substitute for counting for the original um, counting invariant problem. Um, so there's a way of um, defining these invariants in terms of pair moduli spaces. But in fact, the invariants are actually independent of any choices you made in defining your pair invariant, such as the choice of ample line bundle. Okay, um, so far so good. Um, now, 
Okay, so, so what I've said so far is appropriate to the kind of somehow the most obvious classes of theories. Um, it's appropriate to, to cases in which the natural obstruction theories on your moduli spaces um, are perfect in minus one up to zero. Okay, so that, that's true quite a lot of the time. Um, but there's two situations when this is either not true or it's not quite what we want. So we have to modify the picture. So one of these is the, the odd kalabi yau case. Uh, so if A is coherent, she is on a kalabi yau threefold, or the drive category is on a kalabi yau threefold, then the natural obstruction theory on your moduli spaces, um, it's not perfect in minus one up to zero. Uh, it has terms in degree minus two coming from the X3 groups here. Um, so, uh, and in Donson Thomas theory, uh, you remove these by taking some kind of trace three X uh, to define the Donaldson Thomas invariance. So throwing away these X three groups, which are they're basically these are copies of C um, for stable objects. Uh, this changes the real virtual dimension by two. Okay, so it turns out if you want to include these in the in in this big picture, then uh, well, if A is an odd Calabi Yau category. There's a way of modifying the vertex algebra construction uh, I told you about uh, to make the homology of your moduli space, the, the ordinary moduli stack, into a graded vertex Lie algebra uh, with, with graded ch grading change by two. And then the projected linear moduli stack changed, gets again changed into a graded Lie algebra. But again, the grading is changed by two. Uh, but actually, in the Donaldson Thomas of Calabi R3 folds case, you care about the H0 part of this, um, which is actually the ordinary H0, and the Lie bracket in that case is something simple to write down. It's the, it's the same Lie bracket which occurs in Conservative Soberman, Joyce, and Song. Um, so we can include Donaldson Thomas theory uh, for Clabia threefolds in our picture. Uh, Dominic, I'm here a bit confused because uh, uh, in our story with Maxim, uh, uh, we need also, e even without motives, we need this sheaf of vanishing cycles, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we need some extra structure on the stack, which, of course, you, you know very well. Well, yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying you don't. Uh, uh, we, but we, you, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't mention it, so that's... Oh, ah, it's, okay. It's you need some structure to define virtual classes. Um, yeah, but, all right, all right, so, yeah. so basically, we, we want to, I don't know, somehow what Richard Thomas did would be enough. Um, so Richard Thomas constructed a, a perfect obstruction theory on the Calabi R3 moduli spaces. That would give you the, the counting invariance, at least in the, um, uh, in the stable equals semi-stable case. Um, and then the counting invariance, uh, and so then the Lie algebra is, well, the, the, the basically, the, the the Lie algebra is is what we have with uh, with the Lie bracket is involves a minus one to the chi of alpha beta times chi of alpha beta. Uh, that that's where those those numbers come in. So is it just a Lie algebra for H zero? Is it just a Lie algebra yeah. functions on the torus? Which... Yes, basically. Yeah. 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 For, for the uh, yeah, for the for the H zero, it's basically the kind of classical version of this quantum torus thing. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and in that case, the, um, you know, the Lie bracket is a simple thing, but actually, actually this graded, you also, this construction also gives you a Lie bracket on the full cohomology, not just the zero cohomology. And I think that's a bit more non-trivial. Anyway, um, okay, so a second case in which we, we might be interested in is effects of the projective surface with uh, H geometric genus or H02 of X is positive. That corresponds to B2 plus is greater than one. Um, and let's consider moduli spaces of Giesecke's stable sheaves or semi-stable sheaves um, for, with positive rank. So basically moduli spaces of vector bundles, let's say. Um, so then the natural obstruction theory um, is actually got a kind of constant factor of H02 of X star living in degree minus one, um, which causes the invariance to be automatically zero. So therefore, in this case, our theory works 
but it's boring because the invariants are always zero, except for count, well, except for counting dimension, except in rank zero. However, uh, <coughs> you can you can delete um, h zero two of x star from the obstruction theory, can construct a, a new obstruction theory, which has got a slightly different virtual dimension. You, you change the virtual dimension of the problem by h zero two. You can define reduced invariants, which may be non-zero, uh, and that's these are really these are really algebraic Donaldson invariants. So this, this is what you do in order to define a Donaldson invariants um, of your projective surface. Okay, so I my theory has a modification um, for which includes reduced invariants. Um, so I allow it to have a trivial bundle of rank O alpha deleted from the obstruction theories on M alpha, where the, this, the, the bundle you're, de you're deleting is allowed to depend upon the class alpha involved. So then you get a reduced invariant, which rather than living in H hat zero, lives in H hat of twice O alpha of this thing. So then the wall crossing formula, um, which was here, you have to modify it by, you add in an extra condition that you only sum over n tuples alpha one up to n, alpha n such that the dimensions of these obstruction spaces add up to um, of alpha. So, so you you have the same wall crossing formula except fewer terms. Okay, so then using that theory, I can handle algebraic Donaldson invariants for B two plus is greater than one, and also categories which combine Donaldson and cyber witten invariants. Uh, 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 Dominic, I have certain short question. So this uh, low crossing formula, whatever it is, it's it has some um, hidden ha harder Narasimhan uh, property inside that you just compute the same thing in two different ways. Uh, what kind of this reduced low crossing, or whatever which you mentioned, what 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 it's there its meaning? Um. There's kind of no change to that. And that the harder narrow Schiemann property is encoded in these um, conditions you twiddle. But why you sum not over everything, but as you mentioned, over just with some restrictions, is it? Um, it's kind of difficult to explain. Um, basically, certain wall crossings don't change the invariance and that the wall crossings only change the invariance if um, if these numbers add up. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so 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 the, the case of algebraic Donaldson invariance is um, deceptive because in, in the Donaldson invariant case, O alpha, the, o, the all of the O alphas are the same. So all, all of the O alphas are equal. Because of that, um, when when you impose this condition. O alpha is alpha one up to o alpha n. Then the only solution is if n equals one. And so the for the Donaldson invariance, the wall crossing formula tells you that the invariants are independent of the stability condition. You know, uh, m, m alpha tor twiddle is equal to m alpha of tor. So so in that case, the wall crossing formula looks kind of trivial. However. Um, if you make a bigger category which combines Donaldson and cyber witten invariants, then you, the O alphas vary a bit. And because of that, you get non trivial wall crossing formulae. And actually, you can use this wall crossing formulae to prove the Donaldson equals cyber witten story. That is, using the wall crossing formula in this larger category, you can show that you can reconstruct mm. higher rank Donaldson invariants from rank one Donaldson invariants and rank one cyber witten invariants. It's very really nice, but if for B plus equal to one, you have its own wall crossing formula. Yeah. And those... Yeah. So for, for B plus equals one, the same story works, but there's just lots more terms in the wall crossing formula. Yeah. Um, basically, B two plus is greater than one is kind of simpler because you have many fewer terms in your wall crossing formula. But the same theory um, still is, is still effective. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so, um, well, so, so in the paper on the archive, we actually proved these conjectures for the case of uh, the category of representations of a quiver without oriented cycles um, and slope stability conditions. Um, and um, 
oriented cycles include loops as well. You rule out loops, yeah. Um, I allow loops, but not oriented loops. Right, and the, so the, the oriented cycles, this is just to make the modular spaces compact, basically. Um, so, uh, but, but then loop can make it non-compact, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think cycles are the same as loops. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't want a, I don't want a path following, uh, I don't want a loop of oriented edges, um, even one with only one vertex. Okay, so, so, uh, so that, that's just necessary in order to make the modelized spaces compact because otherwise the, the, county, the invariance wouldn't be defined. Um, okay, so, but I, I can actually, um, I can do much better than that. So um, in, in work in progress, um, I've nearly finished proving the conjectures uh, for a wide range of situations in algebraic geometry in which virtual classes are defined using Baron van Tetchy perfect disruption theories. Um, so so I've, I, I have a complete proof of my conjectures for categories satisfying a list of assumptions. Uh, I haven't yet finished writing up the fact that various categories satisfy those assumptions. But if you put those two things together, then uh, this would include invariants counting coherent sheaves on curves and surfaces and Fano threefolds and various categories of things, you know, sheaves plus extra, um, you could quiver representations, quivers with, um, with relations, um, things like sheaves plus extra data, the kind of thing, you know, Higgs fields, far for Witten invariants and so on, um, uh, is, is a very um, general story. Um, so I hope too uh, that my proof uh, is going to extend to the Calabi-Yau fourfold virtual classes uh, without that much extra work. Uh, so this would be using Borisov, Joyce or O. Thomas. Um, so in order for that to work, I would need certain properties of um, Baron van Tetchy virtual classes to work nicely for O. Thomas virtual classes, uh, including, um, well, so including GM localization and certain kinds of pullback by smooth morphisms. Um, anyway, but uh, if, if I sort that out, then we would have a theory of Donaldson Thomas type invariants for Calabi R fourfolds, which would be nice. Um, so various people have been thinking about this in terms of examples for a while. There's a lot of work by people like Yalong Sao and Martin Kuhl, for example. Um, even Nobu Tozes, I think, has done something as well. Um, okay. Um, yeah, perhaps I could also say that for me, the appearance of the vertex algebra in the story is rather mysterious. Um, Okay, I'm kind of used to uh, wall crossing stories happening in a Lie algebra because, you know, that we that happened for the motivic invariance and then it happened for Donaldson Thomas theory and so on. But um, the way this, this vertex algebra has popped up um, in the story, uh, apparently related to an Umtum invariance, is a mystery to me. Um, and you know, I should. Be very interested if people have any kind of perspectives on where it's coming from and what it's for. Yeah, but you kind of you explained that it exists, but uh, you didn't give even a hint. How does it look like? Does it look as any known vertex algebra, or it just a construction? Yes. And you, yeah, uh, it's just construction. Yeah. In the cases when you can compute it. Uh, it's basically a lattice vertex algebra. Um, so, mm -hmm. okay, so, so you can do my picture in for abelian categories or derived categories. Um, somewhat surprisingly, it turns out that the derived category case is kind of easier because, um, well, so the abelian category case, your stack is kind of a monoid in stacks. Whereas in the drive category case, your stack is more like a group in stacks. An abelian group in stacks because you've got you've got an addition operation of direct sum, but there's also shift by one, which is acts as a kind of inverse to direct sum. 
Um, so basically, your um, your the for the derived category case, the moduli stack acts like a group like H space, um, and its homology acts like a um, a hot algebra, and it, it's it's kind of rather computable, and uh, in quite a lot of cases. So there's a the paper by my student Jacob Gross about homology of moduli stacks of complexes. So in quite a lot of cases, you can actually compute the homology of the uh, moduli stack of objects in your drive category completely explicitly. Um, and it turns out to be a kind of, well, it, essentially it's a lattice vertex algebra constructed on the lattice of the K theory of the, uh, uh, of, of the, um, of the, of the thing. So, for example, but, but, but hey, if, 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 if I'm looking for kind of UN instantons, not necessarily of rank one, but something bigger, what kind of category should well, I look? You don't what, what really count this category. I, um, I would want, to, I would say that, I would say for instantons, I'd like to say my space in which everything happens is a mapping space mapped from X into BU cross Z. So that's a kind of, uh, that's a kind of essentially a classifying space for, well, okay, so, so the classifying space for UN bundles is mapped from X into BUN. Uh, a map from X into BU cross Z is, it's kind of the derived category version of that. And, okay, so, so your, your moduli, any moduli space of instantons We'll have a nap, we'll have a kind of classifying map into maps from X into BU cross Z. And I would project the homology class forward into the homology of this mapping space. And the homology of the mapping space is basically a lattice vertex algebra on the homology of X. Uh, so which means that if you change the rank of, of, of instantons, you do not see the change in your vertex algebra kind of differently from what uh, people observed in whatever oh, in physics and mathematics, yeah. You end up in a different component of the moduli space, because uh, in the BU cross Z, Z is keeping track of the rank. Um, so, yeah, but uh, and it, yeah, but you, you should be able to do Donaldson invariance for in all ranks. Anyway, um, so yeah, um, yeah well, so, well, so somehow in the easy cases, these vertex algebras give you um, uh, lattice vertex algebras. And it, in the more difficult cases, it's, 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 your, your problem is, is how do you describe the homology of a big of a moduli stack? Um, anyway, so in the case when, so let me talk about counting strictly semi-stables. Uh, if stable equals semi-stable, then the virtual classes are defined using a geometric structure on the semi-stable moduli space. If there might be smooth schemes or schemes with perfect instruction theories, or in the Clive 4 case, you might be talking about minus two shifted symplectic derived schemes by some known construction. So if the stable moduli space is not equal to the semi-stable moduli space, I've currently got no definition of this virtual class in terms of a geometric structure on the semi-stable moduli space. Um, so my proof works by showing that, well, basically you can find unique virtual classes when stable is not equal to semi-stable, which extend the given ones, in the case stable equals semi-stable, which also satisfy the wall crossing formula. Um, so, and there may be many different ways of, extend, of extending invariance to the case when stable equals, stable is not equal to semi-stable. Um, so for example, that there's a program by um, people like Edidin and Graham and so on uh, about trying to define invariance by Q and blow up. So you start with a moduli stack and you blow up the problematic parts where the stabilizer groups have positive dimension uh, until you get something which has become Dillian Mumford and then you take a, a virtual class of that. Um, so the thing which characterizes my definition of these virtual classes is that they satisfy the wall crossing formula. Um, and okay, in the Joyce Song or Konsevich Sobeman, Donaldson, Thomas invariants, um, 
there is a geometric definition of um, what the of what these invariants are, and it's a complicated mess involving rational weights. Um, but what I'm doing here, it's in terms of virtual classes, and it's not kind of point-wise local in the same way that the Donaldson Thomas story is. Okay. Um, let's talk about motivic invariants. Um, so, and is that unique that uh, requiring that uh, the extension satisfies this uh, local uh, requirement? Does it determine them? For quivers, it does, yes. Um, in the general case, I don't know if that's a unique characterization, uh, but I've got another way to characterize it. Well, um, essentially, in, in the general case, I characterize it using pair invariants. Um, so there's a there's a kind of wall crossing formula which relates pair invariants to the the ordinary invariants, and the pair invariants are always defined because they have stable equal semi stable. Um, yeah, um, but for quivers, it's also true that um, requiring the invariants to satisfy the wall crossing formula determines them uniquely. Okay. Um, so let's. Okay. So. Quick question also um, about yeah. the last slide as well um, about the case when you have a um, strictly semi-stable objects in your moduli space. Yeah. Um, could you say exactly what is the problem with defining virtual class? Is it is it just the fact that the moduli space would be an Arden stack, or is it the obstruction theory has something in minus two, or is it both things? Well, um, you have a, a semi-stable moduli scheme, but you don't have a perfect obstruction theory on it because you can't. And it basically the only way the only way algebraic geometers know of forming virtual classes is to have a proper scheme with a perfect obstruction theory. So um, in this case, you have a semi-stable moduli scheme. You also have a semi-stable moduli stack, which is different. So the problem with the scheme is it doesn't have a obstruction theory because the obstruction theory doesn't extend over the strictly semi-stable points. The problem with the stack is it's an, it's not an stack because the semi-stable points can have positive dimensional stabilizers. So in neither case, can you actually define a, uh, a virtual class? So it's, so if you look at the Artem stack, um, you're saying there is an obstruction theory on that one, but... Uh... Well, the, there's, there's, a, there's, an Artem, there's an obstruction theory in the sense of obstruction theories on Artem stacks. So you get, a perfect, you get a perfect complex with a morphism to the cotangent complex, but now your perfect complex is perfect in the interval minus one up to one. And the, uh, the morphism, it's surjective in degree minus one and isomorphism in degree zero and one or something like that. Right, I see. So, yeah, so the definition of perfect obstruction theory extends to our stacks and indeed to higher stacks, but the construction of virtual classes does not. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, right. So, um, so th this is this whole picture is motivated for me at least by uh, uh, just a comment. Uh, yeah. Lattice view is uh, if you look at their graded character that usually gives a uh, modular form or a mock modular form. And uh, the coefficients of this uh, modular form are usually related with the uh, dimensions of representations of some finite group. Yeah. Is there any uh, geometric interpretation that you get from uh, of these numbers in your geometric picture here? Uh, so the question is, if you uh, look at the graded character of the lattice vertex uh, operator right. algebra. And when you say usually, yeah. uh, I think you're overstating the case. Um, you, you, and it, you would, for example, if you're looking at Caxmoody algebras or something, yeah. then you, you might get this nice modular picture if your intersection form is positive definite. Yeah. Uh, but the, the kind of geometric examples are nearly always never positive de definite. I um, see. So, so, you know, so, so, well, so it's, I think you're, you're talking about rational VOAs. So, so VOAs in which the representation yeah, theory is, is particularly simple. And I think that that's usually not the case for things which come from geometry like coherent sheaves on some high dimensional variety. So I think this modular picture is true for lattice VOAs. Um, I can't... I, I'm asking whether, whether the, the lattice has to be positive definite. Yeah, that's true. It has to be. That's true. 
I'm saying most of my lattices are not positive definite. That, okay. <laughs> Is um, there any special geometry or a special Calabria where you might expect to get the monster vertex algebra? Just so uh, that you might be able to make some geometric sense of these coefficients because uh, in modular world or in the monster world, it's kind of uh, difficult. I don't know. I mean, it's tempting to say it should be something to do with K3, uh, but um, to be honest, I mean, the monster vertex algebra, it isn't a lattice vertex algebra, I don't think. Nope. nope. Um, and so I, I'm not sure. Well, do you solely get lattice vertex? Okay, you are starting off with the lattice. No, I, I, that, yeah. I don't, but I don't <laughs> know how to get anything particularly nice, which isn't a lattice vertex algebra. I mean, it, in my picture, picture, if they're not lattice vertex algebras, they tend not to be vertex operator algebras. Um, I, you, you don't get a conformal vector. And basically you get conformal vectors if you work in the drive category, and then you get a lattice vertex algebra. And if you work with the Belian categories, then there's no conformal vector. I see. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, so th this is this picture was motivated for me by um, uh, some work I did a long time ago on, on motivic invariants, uh, in which I had a kind of wall crossing story, um, and uh, at least for the Calabria threefold invariants. Um, well, so, so I, I had Ringel Hall algebras and Ringel Hall Lie algebras, and I had a, a wall crossing formula which took place in general Lie algebra. This, this new theory, basically, it, 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 you kind of take the, the old picture about invariance and wall crossing formula in a Lie algebra stack functions, and then you replace this Lie algebra by the Lie algebra of the homology of the stack, and then somehow most of the rest of the kind of formal shape of the theory is the same. Okay, um, so uh, just uh, an example of a motivic invariant. Um, if your field K is Q, and uh, in that case, you can construct the Hasseve uh, zeta function of your variety. And I think that uh, satisfies these two properties that you wrote down. If you have a closed sub variety, then the Hasseve zeta function uh, factorizes into a product of the sub variety and the uh, the complement, given that the sub variety is also defined over Q. So it, the question is, um, is the Hasseve zeta function a motivic invariant in your setting? If your variety is different with you? I don't know. I mean, I'm no number theorist, to be honest. Um, for me, every field has characteristic zero. Uh, and I tend to think about motivic invariants as being like virtual Poincare polynomials, virtual Hodge polynomials, and so on. And maybe the Hasseve thing fits into this picture, but it's, it's not relevant to what I'm talking about today. It's relevant to what I was doing 20 years ago. The, the number of points or a finite field is also a motivic invariant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, okay. and that's easier than the global Hasseway. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, well, I should be wrapping up soon. Uh, but, um, well, let, let me talk a little bit more about the vertex and the algebra story on homology modelized stacks. Um, so let's take A to be a, a C linear, a B linear or triangular category. Algebraic geometry or representation theory. Could be coherent sheaves on some smooth projective scheme or its drive category or quiver representations or the drive quiver representations. So we'll take M to be its modelized stack of objects. So that'll be an R trans stack uh, for the abelian category case and a higher stack for the triangular category case. Okay, so this is the morphism phi going from M cross N into M, uh, which basically acts by direct sum on objects in your category. So GM uh, acts on objects E in A uh, by rescaling each object by the multiple field entity. Uh, in the world of stacks, this gives you an action, psi, of point mod GM cross M into M uh, of the group stack point mod GM on M. So this is not the same thing as a GM action. This is a, an in, this is a completely stacky phenomenon. Um, it's a bit like saying, well, BGM is, is a kind of infinite dimensional group, and it's, it's a bit like saying we have a, an action of BGM on M. Um, and, okay, so the projective linear modulized stack is a quotient of M by this group, uh, by this group stack. Um, okay, and there's a morphism from there to there, which is a, it's a point mod GM vibration except, except over zero. Um, 
Okay, uh, so we need this, this extra data, a quotient of the K theory, uh, an Euler form. Now, a perfect complex C to an M cross M. Uh, so it, it, this is part of the, the, the data for my construction of vertex algebras, but um, basically it's going to be the dual of the X complex or the symmetrized dual of the X complex, if you want the Clavier 4 case or the general case. Um, and we also want some signs um, which have to do with orientations, um, but in the Baron Fantecci case, there's a natural choice for these. Uh, basically, the signs are minus one to the rank of the X complex. Okay, so then we can make the homology H star of M and we can shift its, uh, its gradient and make it into a graded vertex algebra. So here's a formula for the, the, well, the, the main part of the vertex algebra structure is the state field correspondence. And here's an explicit formula for it. Um, so I'm starting with a U in uh, the homology class, uh, a homology of some class M alpha and V in the homology of uh, another component M beta. And then Y of U comma Z of V is, well, so there's some sign attached to alpha and beta. Uh, and then a minor, another sign here. Then Z, so Z is a formal variable in the, um, in the, the vertex algebra structure, Z to the power of chi of alpha beta times, this is a homology pushed forward of the stack morphism phi composed with psi times identity. So this is mapping point mod GM cross M cross M. Um, okay, so then, right. Uh, well, so here I'm taking the churn character of um, my, that's basically the X complex on M cross M. Uh, we do something weird to it. We sum it over here with a linked power of Z and some numbers, take the exponential of that. We take the cap product of that with U tends to V. This is in the homology of M cross M. The T to the I here are the generators of the homology of point mod GM in the dimension two I. Uh, we take that sum. So, okay, so this is a weird, weird formula. Um, and, but it turns out to give you a vertex algebra. Um, and uh, then from the vertex algebra, you can induce a Lie algebra structure on this thing, basically by the Borchard's um, construction of Vertic Lie algebras from, ver from vertex algebras. Um, okay, um, and okay, let me make the remark that you can often write down the homology of these moduli stacks with their algebraic structures explicitly. And the answer is usually simpler in the derived category case. So for example, my student Jacob showed that if you have a smooth projective scheme X, which is a curve, or a surface, or a toric variety, or a few other cases. And if M is a moduli stack of the derived category of Cohen-Chi's on X, then the, um, the homology of the moduli stack is, can be identified with, okay, so the, basically this, this is an infinite polynomial ring uh, based on the, the topological K theory of X, um, and extended by polynomials in, in T squared. Um, so, so this is the odd part. So that's the even part. So it's roughly speaking, it's a pol this, this part is a kind of polynomial algebra or a super polynomial algebra in an infinite number of even variables and an infinite number of odd variables. So that is the, the kind of semi-topological K theory. Um, in nice cases, this is just the same as the ordinary K zero. Um, for example, if, if X is a, surface with geometric genus zero, this would be ordinary K zero of X. So this is all very computable and it has a super lattice vertex algebra structure, which you can write down uh, in a very explicit way in terms of these kind of polynomial um, uh, things. So we can use it, so we can actually, uh, the theory is explicit enough to use it for explicit computations in examples, as well as just for, for abstract theory. <coughs> Um, and in fact, I've been banging my head against uh, actually doing computations for coherent sheaves on surfaces and the kind of Donaldson the theory uh, story for the last month or so. Um, so if you're going to work with coherent sheaves, even if you only care about the abelian category coherent sheaves, 
uh, it's quite helpful to actually project to the homology of the drive category moduli spaces. So then you can use this explicit presentation here. Um, and finally, although Lie algebras are much simpler than vertex algebras, it's rather difficult to write down the Lie bracket on the projective linear. Actually, it's, it's not even that easy to write down this homology space itself. Um, and the best way to actually write down this Lie bracket appears to be via the vertex algebra structure um, up here on the original moduli stack. Okay, so I've only got through about half my slides, but I think I should stop there because um, I've said the most important things I wanted to say. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's a very uh, enlightening and exciting talk. Uh, are there any questions? So actually, uh, I, 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 I do have a few. So uh, one thing still confuses me, it's uh, that the shift of vanishing cycles, which is a kind of perverse shift on the derived stack, if you want derived, it, 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 it does not appear in uh, at yeah. all. So you're, uh, no? you build your vertex algebra structure out of something which oh, oh, yes. kind of you, you already have some X, X groups, uh, but uh, yeah. if you add some additional structure like this, um, uh, chief of vanishing cycles coming from the potential if it exists or some other kind of perverse shifts, I don't know in, in non colloidal case. Uh, will you get I mean, okay. something more? Yeah. I, I have no use for the perverse sheaf vanishing cycles thing in, in Calabria threefolds in this picture. Um, so yeah, okay. I mean, it, it doesn't seem possible, as far as I know, to define the vertex algebra structure on the hypercomology of the perverse sheaf. And also, you shouldn't regard Donaldson in that Donaldson Thomas invariance as taking values in that hypercomology. Um, I, know, I would say that um, the perverse chief of vanishing cycles, it's kind of a middle infinite dimensional homology. You know, if, if we pretend that the moduli stack of things in your Columbia threefold is, has got dimension H to N, where N is very large, then the uh, hypercomology of the perverse chief of vanishing cycles is kind of, it's like the homology of in degree n plus k, for k small. But um, I'm interested in hk for k small, not hn plus k for k small. Um, yeah, so, so I don't think this picture talks to the, um, uh, talks to the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles, but nor do I think the Donaldson Thomas invariants talk particularly nicely to the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles. Um, uh, you mentioned this Mativic whole algebra structure. If you yeah. uh, treat it not as a Lie algebra, but as an associative algebra, which it is, so you, you do need this shift finishing cycles. Um, yeah, so, but you use just Lie algebra. Actually, from the vertex algebra, you can construct also an associative algebra by this construction of Zhu. Yeah. But, uh, so I, I really don't know. It looks like uh, there are more structures in this Mativic Donaldson Thomas theory that uh, you have kind of displayed. The, at least not more, but there are some. Yeah, but, but I think the I think that the hypercomology perverse she story is it, it's different. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's not it's not what I'm doing. Um, and you know, to do, well, when I do the stack function version of, of this story to get a, a whole algebra, um, essentially uh, I use the kind of classical stack and the Barrett function or mm -hmm. possibly a motivic Barrett function, but I didn't use the, I didn't use a perverse sheaf. You know, the perverse sheaf is, you can, you, you can kind of take a pointwise or characteristic and get a Barrett function and then involve it in, in these whole algebras. But I don't want to think about the hypercomology of the perverse sheaf as being a whole algebra. And you can get a 
cohomological Hoare algebra out of it in, in different way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know the different way, but I just want to kind of combine it with uh, with the story which you, you told us today. Uh, another question is that you, it looks like you see uh, almost, as you said, uh, just uh, um, uh, lattice vertex algebra. And, uh, you know, it often appears when you uh, kind of consider like uh, bosonization of something like uh, uh, or whatever, or free fermion presentation that you have something more complicated, but explain it in terms of vertex operators like Shugavara construction, Foucault Smoody. Uh, so, uh, so then, I mean, it's a bit strange. There should be kind of maybe more uh, complicated vertex algebras, but if you kind of add more structures, I don't know. Like you mentioned that you can uh, mm, uh, derive this Nakajima E1 instant on story, but you should do something mm, with your construction. But for E1, it's really the latest vertex algebra. It's like Heisenberg, that's it. But for U2, it's already Virasora. And so that. The Gukov BOM M4 story, or what? No, 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 no. I, I mean this, uh, say, uh, okay, let's call it AGT story that um, if you consider UN uh, instantons, then you have a vertex algebra, which is a W algebra of uh, um, SLM or GLM, better to say, GLM. Mm, uh, that's what is intrinsically related. That's so is that a rigorous story or is it string theory? No, no, no. It's a completely rigorous story in terms of the proving the conjecture that if you have, it's a generalization of Nakajima, if you like. You take the cohomology of the moduli space of mm, UN instantons, framed instantons like uh, torsion free shifts of rank M and CP2 with trivialization and the line at infinity. You take the cohomology for fixed M for fixed rank, but uh, you do not fix Chernko. I mean, you can fix Chernko if you like. All right. And there is an action of a W algebra. Some W algebra for n equal one, for n equal one, it's exactly Nakajima's which is a lattice vertex algebra. For n equal to it, it's Virasora, and for higher, it's W algebra to the corresponding uh, GLN, but uh, kind of, they do not have very nice description, but they have some kind of description in terms of Virasora and lattice. So in particular, if you know what to do with n equal to, and you say that you know what to do with n equal one, it's latest, then maybe you can handle this AGT in a more conceptual way. So far people kind of prove it like Schiffman and Vassero just by hand, by constructing this section. Uh, mm, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not too hopeful. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I know. I thought about such things. I mean, um, one of my problems is, um, okay, it, I, I get operations which act on the homology of the entire moduli stack. And then you'd like to say, can we find operations which, so then you say, well, we have the homology of the semi-stable moduli stacks. We map them in to the homology of the entire moduli stack, regardless of the vector subspace. And then you'd like to say, well, are, are those vector subspaces close under some of the operations in my vertex algebra? Yes, yeah, so you mentioned this pair story, which looks like framed shifts. Um, yeah? And it's yeah. exactly what's happening in this instant on story that I just framed shifts. Yeah. At the moment, I, haven't, I don't really have good reasons for these homologies are semi-stable things to be closed under algebraic operations in the, the larger stack. Um, 
uh, and it, 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 morally speaking, it's some kind of homological version of, of the of virtual Indian composable story. But um, you know, it's, it's something I haven't got very far with. But and this this whole picture, you know, there's a kind of hundred different directions you can go in. Um, it, it, it seems, um, and and most of them I, I haven't been able to explore. Uh, I, I, I have also kind of question that since you use a derived algebraic geometry anyway, what derived whatever geometry, uh, uh, there is a generalization of the uh, classical story of instantons by Nikrasov, where you instead of a single uh, say C square, which is R4, uh, you consider a collection of them like collection of say coordinate uh, um, uh, coordinate planes C square in inside of four dimensional collabial. Uh, and these uh, C squares, they uh, intersect kind of transversally. So they form um, a non-smooth uh, four dimensional, if you like space time on which uh, um, uh, these generalized on the cross of instant ones live. Uh, and uh, I, I, I remember, I, I, I thought that maybe uh, you can define the virtual class in the derived sense, since uh, in any case, uh, your uh, space time is non smooth. Uh, but uh, this is a generalization which where maybe there are kind of uh, new vertex algebras. Um, uh, certainly, there is a generalization of AGT to this case. That's what uh, what we did with with uh, student of Gayu uh, 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 Rabchak Yang Dinzhao. We, we did it uh, for uh, three copies of C square for three coordinates planes and C cube instead of four dimensional collabial. We consider simple case three dimensional collabial. And by reducing to quivers with potential, which you do not like, uh, we, uh, we were able to construct some vertex algebra acting and uh, anyway, generalize this Ayoto, Aldai Gayoto, Chikawa AGT story. Mm, uh, but probably what you've said that it can be upgraded to the case of not necessarily a smooth uh, four dimensional things if you consider uh, them in the right sense. In any case, you assume that your virtual classes can be somehow constructed as part of the structure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you don't have new ways of defining virtual classes. Um, uh, well, except. My theory says a lot about how to count strictly semi-stables, but it doesn't tell you anything about how to form virtual classes for kind of ordinary modelized spaces. Mm. Um, yeah, and I don't know. And it, if you could think about these objects as modelized spaces of sheaves on a Clavier fourfold, then you will get a Clavier four virtual class. Yeah, I can, but uh, what I don't know, I don't know the stability structure. So of course, everything is non-compact. Yes, so it's kind of maybe a bit complicated to say, but you, you can try to think in terms of compactification and Giesecker stability, but I really don't know. It's something which kind of missing in that story. And con for conventional instantons, um, uh, you can interpret those moduli spaces as spaces of Mm, stable representations of an Akajima quiver. So in terms of linear algebra data. So you have both sides, algebra geometric, like framed shifts and uh, uh, quiver, which are stable representations. But for uh, the generalized Nikrasov story, I have only the quiver side. And it, it does not look difficult, but it looks like it's open question for several years. 
how to interpret his modulate spaces as modulate spaces of certain coherent shifts on C4 or even C, C cube. It's a special case with supports on on coordinate on, on some planes like two dimensional C square planes, some coordinate planes with an additional uh, stability. Uh, property which I don't know what is it. Yeah. Uh, so then in your story, I, I looked at your slides in the quiver case, you, you do not have the potential, you have just quivers. Oh, and okay. which is natural because you do not want oriented cycles and therefore the potential should be trivial. No, that, that, was just the, uh, that was just the easiest case. I mean, my, my general theory will handle Quivers with, quivers with with relations. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, well, so, so there's an, a simple notion of quiver with relation which will give you um, Baron Pantecci obstruction theories on the moduli spaces. Um, and um, as long as you can arrange to have compact moduli schemes, then my theory will give you invariance and walk off uniformity. Uh, I think in that story, the moduli spaces are non-compact, but there is a torus section, and it's quite typical in, in actually in physics that the moduli space is non-compact, but fixed points under the action of the torus is compact. And this is why they can kind of integrate in the virtual sense. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, and so what happens here? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I have a way of applying my theory to that kind of, that sort of situation, kind of by cheating. So if you've got an abelian category with a, a torus action acting on the category, mm -hmm. um, you can make another category in which the objects are kind of, in which the objects in the other category are the equivariant objects in the first category. So basically objects in these, in the in your new category are they correspond to the fixed point the fixed point loci, loci in uh, in moduli spaces so that then you, you can apply my theory to to the fixed point category um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and you get invariance out of that and then you can kind of push those forward to uh, you know, so that basically tells you about invariants, which are the virtual classes of um, the fixed point loci in the in the original problem, um, and and so my theory will apply to that and will give you will give you an answer. Um, so there's there's a kind of interesting phenomenon though, which is that um, the you could make a can. You can make a there's a okay so so you you, you make him you make invariants out of the fixed point loci, and then you project them to the equivariant homology of the original problem. And the, the equivariant homology of the original problem has a Lie bracket on it. Uh, well, if you set it up right, at least mm -hmm. uh, it, you, you can you can make this this vertex algebra Lie algebra structure. Um, but it's not clear that in the equivariant homology, the, the same wall crossing formula will be true. Uh, because, it's, because it's not clear that the, project, the, Lie algebra, the vertex algebra or Lie algebra projections might not be vertex algebra morphisms. Basically, there is a problem if the, the normal bundles of the fixed point loci are complexes rather than vector bundles. Um, so, so basically, my theory can handle situations in which um, you're looking at compact fixed point loci but non-compact moduli spaces. But, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but something may go wrong with the wall crossing formulae if you try and project to equivariant homology in the target. Yes. Um, yes, yes. I don't really understand very well yet, but. Um, yeah, um, I think that there are, you have, 
there are some conditions which have to be satisfied before the wall crossing you formula you expect actually holds in these situations. Yeah, there might be some hidden additional hidden structure like similar to the one which we saw with, with Maxim and this cohomological hole. When we go to equivariant cohomology and of the moduli, it was a quiver with potential story or whatever quillian smooth algebra with potential. Uh, but on the moduli stacking it, there was a uh, kind of a filtration, uh, filtration by spaces with a fixed harder Narasimon type. And uh, when we go to the equivariant cohomology uh, and we think of them as modules of the equivariant cohomology of a point, like, like you do, so they form kind of a system of factorizable shifts. The, uh, for 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 each churn class, there was uh, uh, in our case it was a coherence shift on on the fine space uh, 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 without some collection of um, of uh, coordinate planes where kind of um, uh, transversal weights coincide in this in the idea about localization but uh, these coherent shifts they satisfy some mm, mm, factorization property for different term classes which somehow replaced mm, mm, the wall crossing because when you treat it when you treat the story in this way instead of the original cohomology of the whole stack then uh, of course uh, this nice wall crossing uh, mm, formulas are missing but this factorization structure appears i don't know whether it's relevant or not but yeah it's interesting yeah okay uh, so uh, uh, maybe uh, i kind of occupy it all all, all the q and a uh, other uh, more questions please yes i have yes, two uh Two questions, and one of them is uh, in your uh, definition of the vertex uh, operator Y Z, and yeah. the, in the following slide, the, the following line you have uh, uh, the action on the vacuum element identity. Uh, you that's the exponential e to the Z D. So um, roughly, what what is the D? I try to look at the uh, get a feeling what the D here in your uh, setting is. Uh, it's, it has to do with this, um, th this, this part of the formula yes. here, the mm -hmm. um, okay. so, so, well, the homology of the stack point mod GM is a homology of CP infinity. Uh -huh. So that's, so, so that it's, it's rationals in each degree to I. And, okay. um, so, uh, what what D really does, or, or what mm -hmm. e to the, the D really does, is it uh, you. Oh, so I had this map psi uh, here somewhere. Um, yeah. So so the the, the 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 map psi taking point mod GM cross M into M. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the the e to the z the 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 D operator. What you do is you take uh -huh. the generator of H two of point mod ZM, yeah. and you say, if you have some class in the homology of M, you say, well, we take the exterior product of that, the, uh, the exterior tensor product of, of that with the class, the class in H two of GM, of point uh -huh. mod GM, and then you push it forward along psi. Okay, I see. That increases see. the homology dimension by two. Oh, you increase by two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and the, the d to the k is basically use the generator of h two k of point mod g m. Okay. Um, okay. That. So 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 this was just a a, a fast so way. So that in, yeah. in the vertex operator algebra, that's is that a l net l minus one in this case or? Uh, sorry. Is that that's the that's the shift operator right for the vertex algebra? Uh. Yeah, well, yes, yes, so D, I, I, I usually call it the translation operator. Translation operator, okay, yes, some um, call the shift. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 
my second question is that here you're use, you're using the homology group and uh, with a degree shifted of the of m yes. and to define this uh, vertex algebra structure and and also because of this uh, the star over gm because the, the homology gives this q that's a polynomial what happens if instead of uh, taking the homology you take k theory uh, um, how yeah. difficult I and mean, will that possibly work or yes yeah and it, 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 there's lots of generalizations of this um, uh -huh. when we take k theory i mean k homology kind of homology version of k theory so well so what the the generality is if you have a complex oriented generalized homology theory such as k theory mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, then uh well to to any such complex oriented homology theory you, you can associate a, a formal group law mm -hmm. um you know with, with, with values in the, the the generalized homology of a point as its base ring um also to each ver the there's a notion of vertex algebra corresponding to formal group laws, where classical okay. vertex algebras are just vertex algebras um, associated to the formal the, the group law x plus y. So, mm -hmm. um, so they're called vertex f algebras for f formal group law. Okay, I see. But the rule is that if you replace, you can replace a homology by any complex oriented generalized homology theory, and then uh, you can construct vertex f algebras where f is a formal group law attached to mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay well, and sorry, that, that, that's because of this uh, of phi that uh, m m cross m sending to m and you uh, you want to fight is 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 because of passing this to the homology you want to the formal group law. yeah um yeah the, well, the formal group law is to do with the homology of this point mod gm mm -hmm. and Okay, so so yeah, so basically the multiplication on point mod GM, uh, the action of that on homology is is what encodes the formal group law. I see. Yeah, so, so what what I was uh, thinking in mind that if I take the K theory, so the the star over GM becomes yeah, instead I, of a polynomial ring, but it's a Laurent theory, Laurent polynomial ring. Yeah, you, you, you can have you can a get, T inverse yeah. also added. You can get vertex algebras attached to the multiplicative formal group law. I, mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. kind of lied a little bit in, in that for these other vertex, I kind of need an even Calabi Yau condition to build vertex algebras. I the even Calabi Yau condition is it's more difficult for other formal group laws. Okay. Uh, I see, I see. So, so it's not clear how, what to do about Calabi Yau fourfolds for, K, for the K theory, for example. but uh, anyway, but th there is a construction, um, and uh, well, there's a kind of general construction of what I call quantum vertex f algebras. Mm -hmm. So things where the things not necessarily it's not exactly commutative, but there's a an R matrix which measures the non-commutativity. I see, because there are, there are many different uh, versions of a quantum vertex algebra by many different people. Uh, they are quite different. So you, you are talking in, in terms of the R matrix. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I, I like, um, yeah, I like non non local vertex algebras and um, meromorphic vertex algebras. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, I, I know what that means. That uh, non local. And yeah, but but usually and. It, Usually, the, it, it comes with an R matrix more as a free. Um, you know, the, uh, so, uh, and it, the and it, the R matrix is um, it's kind of what you get by symmetrizing this theta thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The theta thing is kind of a Borch's by character, mm -hmm. um, and the R matrix is what you get by. Com by com comparing the Borch's by character, and it's it's kind of what you get when you swap it, swap the two two factors round. Mm -hmm. Okay, my last question is that uh, you mentioned about the virtual uh, fundamental class and the existence of that. So you, I know that uh, in in many other parts you need it, but in building these uh, vertex algebra 
structure. Is that crucial, the existence of a fundamental class? No. The, no, no. The, uh, um, the vertex algebra structure exists in huge generality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So That's what I felt. Almost any abelian category or triangulated category you like, you can build the vertex algebra structure on its, um, on its homology, the homology mm -hmm. is back. Um, so, whereas, and if, well, so, so for example, you can build vertex algebras on the homology of the modelized space of coherent sheaves on any smooth projective scheme of any dimension. Mm -hmm. Whereas enumerative invariants will be in the uh, most heavy terrain. Low dimension only, you know, you can do, do something dimensions one, two, you can do something, you can do something Calabi R3, you do something for Fano's or Calabi R3, false dimension three, you can do something different in Calabi R4, and nothing at all works in dimensions five and higher. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, basically, an intimate invariance are a low dimensional story, whereas the vertex side of the story is completely general. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate all the answer. Uh, okay, uh, any more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Dominique for the wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And this is it for today.